Hello, my name is Naomi Martin. Um, I am a second year student at the University of Denver, and I am an ACS Next Generation leader. Um, I am so excited to be here. This is my first ACS student convention, um, and I am honored to introduce our next speaker, Washington State's Lieutenant Governor, Cyrus Habib. Lieutenant Governor Habib has accomplished a lot in his 37 years including being elected Washington's 16th Lieutenant Governor and becoming the youngest presiding officer in the country. He also holds the honor of being the first and only Iranian-American official to hold a statewide elected office in the entire nation. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Habib attended Columbia University, Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, and Yale Law School. He is a Truman Scholar, a Soros Fellow, and a Seattle University Law School Professor and Distinguished Lawmaker in Residence. All of these positions and honors are, in and of themselves, amazing. However, Lieutenant Governor Habib has accomplished all of this as a three-time cancer survivor who has been blind since the age of eight. What an honor it is to have such an inspiring leader with us here tonight. Please join me in wel welcoming Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's so warm. You don't even know what I'm going to say yet. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you to everyone, Molly and all the staff who have made this possible. Um, and I want to say uh, to, uh, to ACS, uh, congratulations on turning 18 years old. You're, you're now eligible what? You're eligible to vote. You are eligible... <laughs> Now, if you thought you were making political change before, you're just getting started, right? Um, isn't it, um, it's, it is unbelievable to think that this organization, that when I started law school in 2006, was already, everybody already knew it um, as the, at, you know, at that time, you know, we, we'll, we're going to get to a point where the Federalist Society is known as uh, the, the corollary to ACS. Uh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen, but in 06, it was already um, it was all it was already known, um, and that was only five years in. And so I couldn't believe it when 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 somebody told me 2001. Um, it, it just uh, it, it blew my mind. So 18 years, what a set of accomplishments! And uh, you know, I'm not surprised because I know Carolyn Fredrickson. The reason I know her and how smart and talented and brilliant she is is that she was my first boss in politics when I was an intern for Senator Maria Cantwell and she was the chief of staff. So uh, this is a phenomenal organization with great leadership and you all are the next generation of that leadership. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this um, and now I'll take any questions. No, um, uh, no. Uh, so, so I wanted to, to um, I'm going to tell you a bit about um, advocacy um, and, and how I see the role of litigation fitting within it, a kind of advocacy beyond litigation. Um, but I just decided, uh, without actually telling my staff, uh, that I'm going to go off script and actually talk about, I want to, you know, sometimes with things like this, you know, we're all kind of politically aligned, and, and there's it's just too much of a kumbaya in these breakout sessions, like I've been to these things. So I actually want to, I'm like not in an election year, and I just found out there's no Washington State chapters here, so I'm actually just going to say some controversial things and try to be a little provocative, and, and then hopefully, yeah. Well, that's what you're saying now. <laughs> that's it's just you wait. Um, so, and then, you know, and just, just try to be a little provocative before I take some Q&A. Um, so, so let me tell you, let's talk about advocacy. Um, as you heard, my, my story is a little different than a lot of other people um, in, in politics. I, uh, my, my parents were immigrants to this country. They came here from Iran. Um, I should say they... Um, would not have been able to come under the current circumstances. Uh, my father came uh, on a student visa to study at the University of Washington, and my, my mother came later in the decade. And 
Um, they ended up, they were, they were married, and I was born um, actually not terribly far from here uh, in Maryland. And, um, but shortly after I was born, I was diagnosed with a rare childhood eye cancer that took the eyesight in my left eye as a newborn uh, and then came back again and took the eyesight in my right eye when I was eight years old, leaving me completely blind. Now, I often joke that because that happened in 1989, that's when I was eight years old, um, it is actually true that all eight years that I could see did take place within the 1980s. So, so still, today, all my visual memories are still from the 1980s, and everyone still looks like Cindy Lauper and Boy George. <laughs> I appreciate it. Some people are like, I don't know who that is, and some people laughed. I, I like that. Thank you. Um, thanks for your courtesy. So, um, so we moved, we moved uh, to, to Washington State, where my dad had gone to college, and... Um, and when I tell people about the, you know, my path, as I sometimes say, my path from Braille to Yale, there's a, there's a story that I, that I tell um, fairly often. Um, and I want to share it with you because it's really the moment that I learned uh, the importance of advocacy, which as a three-time cancer-surviving, fully-blind Iranian-American from a mixed-religion immigrant family, you can imagine, <laughs> was important. Um, here's the story. So, so I was, I was in third grade. I'd just become blind. And, um, what's every third grader's favorite time of the school day? Recess, right? So I'm surprised that more people didn't know the answer to that, but okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. Recess, usually people know. Um, so, so recess is a favorite time of day. And, uh, my school was no different, even in kind of, yes, kind of rainy Seattle. Kids like to go out and play on the playground and the jungle gym and the swing sets, et cetera. And so, um, so the school did not want me to go out there and play on the swings and the, and the slides and everything. They, they thought it was too dangerous. I think they didn't want me to play in part because they knew I'd just become blind and I think more importantly because they knew my mother was a litigator. <laughs> um, so, 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 uh, so they kept me by the... Uh, by the school building on the sidelines of the playground while the other kids would, would play. And so, as you can imagine, this is hugely demoralizing to an eight-year-old. Um, and I went home and I told my parents that I was being excluded. And uh, my mom went to the, to the school the next day to the principal's office, and she actually took me with her to the principal's office so that I could learn how to be an advocate for myself. And she said to the principal of the school, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my son to your school over the weekend, and I'm going to teach him how to get around the whole playground and learn all the playground equipment and learn his way around. And he's going to learn it differently, but he's going to learn it just as well as any of his classmates. And then she said, you know, it may happen, may happen that he may slip and fall, and he may even slip and fall and break an arm. That's a fear that any mother has. But she said, I can fix a broken arm. I can never fix a broken spirit. Now, I, I, tell, you that, I tell you that story because, you know, kids, kids don't know. We re, you know, all of us, when we were kids, we received kind of signals from the world about what we were entitled to and weren't entitled to. We learned those early lessons about fairness, about justice, about equality. We learned them so early. And I think actually, you know, uh, a lot of uh, research, uh, brain science, has shown that, you know, we're actually wired to, to, to understand fairness and equality. We actually have to learn unfairness um, from society. Um, and, but... But in that moment, as a kid with a disability and a kid who was different in so many, different, in, in so many other ways, um, I learned the importance of inclusion and I learned the importance of speaking up for that inclusion and that it worked. Because, you know, like, think about it. When you're a kid, like, like the principal is the principal, right? So having, having a, you know, someone go and, and argue on your behalf, it was just a really powerful thing to me. Um, and so as I grew older... You know, of course, I, you know, I had to advocate for myself in, in other ways. Uh, and when there were t 
teachers and administrators and others who, who didn't want, think I should be able to participate in uh, after-school activities or take advanced placement exams uh, or advanced placement courses even. Um, and so I learned how to advocate for myself. But, and I also realized that most people, surprise, don't have the benefit of a 24-hour-a-day pro bono attorney <laughs> to train them. And so I decided I wanted to go to law school uh, because I wanted to make a difference and actually be an advocate for others because I knew from personal experience what it felt like to be excluded, what it felt like to be on the outside. Um, and it really came from that understanding that I got from my mom that it's always the question is you start from a place of saying we're going to make this work and then the question is how. Um, so that's the first thing I want to tell you about advocacy is, is uh, that I learned it early on and I learned how important it was. And then, you know, when you, when, you, when you become an attorney, what you realize, and maybe some of you already realize this as law students, is that what's so powerful about the law, okay, and being a lawyer is that you don't even need to use, it's like my mom didn't even need to go to court. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, the, it's like how, you know, it's, it's, it's like how a lot of times being wealthy you then get things that you don't even need to spend the money on. It's just having it is its own status, right? And so it's the same thing with the law. Like, she didn't even need to sue them. She just needed to show up, and they knew that she, like, could, <laughs> right? That she understood it, and that she understood the law. So it's a hugely powerful thing. So then, you know, I mean, so it's, you know, I don't want to get sidetracked, but just to say that, like, when you guys and you all, I'm sure, are, are thinking about or are doing some clinics, but you see when there's massive disparities between, for example, landlord, landlords and tenants or employers and employees. And, it's just, and that's the difference that's, that, that an attorney can make in the life of a person, a pro bono attorney, et cetera. So the second thing, um, the second thing I want to tell you about advocacy, the second anecdote I want to share before then I, I start um, pissing you off with controversial statements is... Um, is uh, I want to tell you a story from, from when I was a 1L. And uh, it was 2006, and I had just come back from studying in England, and um, Wi-Fi on campuses was, bless you, Wi-Fi on campuses, it was a dramatic sneeze, so I thought it deserved to bless you from the podium. Um, Wi-Fi was new. <laughs> Wi-Fi was new, I'm distracted now. Wi-Fi was new. Um, was new on campus, at least for me, in, o in 06, because they didn't have it at Oxford. They didn't, I don't, they didn't have internet in some places. Um, and so I, so I was sitting there in my civil procedure class, and the way, so you need to know this, so the way that I use a computer is that I have software on the screen that reads what's on the computer screen. Um, it's not relevant to the story, but I don't want you to be distracted as I'm telling you the story, being like, how could he... Browse the web. Okay, so that's how I do it. So, so, what I, so what I was doing was I was, you know, so what I would do in class is I'd have like one earbud in and I'd be taking notes in theory and I would be listening to the, the, the professor lecturing. So I was sitting there and I was, you know, it was like one of these classes was not super inspiring or interesting. And so I was on the New York Times website and I read about this case. The case was called American Council of the Blind versus Paulson. And Paulson was Hank Paulson who was the Treasury Secretary under George W. Bush. And um, the lawsuit, American Council of the Blind v. Paulson, was alleging that um, U.S. currency, the actual bills that we use, right, the $5 bill, $10 bill, that those are um, uh, inaccessible, illegal and inaccessible under Section 508 of the Rehabilitations Act, under federal law, because they cannot be distinguished by someone who's blind or even by some people who are low vision. So you can't tell the difference in a tactile way between a $10 or a $20 bill. And anyone who's blind can tell you that. There's, they, you know, we find different ways. Um, and like for those of you who are like, you know, younger, and many of you are, like, um, cash used to matter more than it does now. <laughs> so like, this is like, like, in a way, I know this whole thing is kind of bracketed in obsolescence, but it's like, it, 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 it actually was like a real issue, right, when you wanted to pay for things. Um, and so, and so, so it was like uh, the, the, the lawsuit was saying, you know, if you're, if you're blind, like you can't, um, you go to get a cup of coffee, um, you, you, you know, you don't know whether they're giving you precise change or not. And I really understood that because I just lived in England where 
they, it is tactilely distinguishable. You know, the pound, the different notes. Um, and it turned out, when I looked into it, that, um, that actually every industrialized country has money other than us that is, that is tactilely distinguishable. And in fact, um, 141 countries total, including Zimbabwe, also have made that accommodation, and we had not. Um, and so I went to the professor, who was also the dean of the law school, and said, not that I wasn't paying attention in class, but I just read about this case, and I'd love to get um, involved with it somehow, because I really feel passionate about this issue. Um, and he said, well, you should go find a client um, and write an amicus brief. And so, and I'm, this is like, you know, I'm first semester, 1L year. So, so I was like, I don't really know. Um, but I mean, you know, good, so I mean, it's like, yeah, it's, it's admirable that he believed in me. And I, um, so I found, so I found a partner who knew more about what he was doing. And I, and I, we found, um, and, and we kind of looked into it, and what we realized was um, that basically, you know, while it's, also, while it's true that it's difficult for a blind customer uh, to be able to, 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 to use cash in a way that, that's really equitable, the bigger problem, as I saw it, was actually what about the, the person on the other side of the counter? What about the ability of someone who's blind to actually work in an environment where you need to be able to make change? Um, and, uh, sorry, I just got distracted by the pun on make change. And I, um, so, 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 so it like, you know, so I, so I went and I, and I found the Perkins School for the Blind, which is the, you know, the oldest school for the blinds where Helen Keller went. And it turned out that, yeah, it, you know, it, like, it's really hard. As I like to say, even um, when I grew up, you know, in Maryland, um, we had lemonade stands as kids. And I just say, like, even a four-year-old knows not to put the blind kid on cashier duty at the lemonade stand, right? Because you can't make change for, for the customer. And this creates kind of a long-term financial literacy and so on. And so, so I ended up representing the Perkins School for the Blind in this litigation that went up to the D.C. Circuit Court. Um, and there were two conservative judges and one more liberal judge um, on the panel. And um, we, we made this argument in the amicus brief, and one of the two conservative judges... Uh, actually ended up siding with the American Council of the Blind, getting us the win, and the grounds for that were his, you know, he wasn't that persuaded by the party brief, but he was persuaded that, you know, and you can understand from a conservative perspective, if people say, hey, blind people want to start working, it turns out that entry-level jobs often require the ability to be able to denominate bills, and if you can't get entry-level jobs, you can't kind of build up a resume and work experience to keep working. And so many people, that may be a contributing factor to, pe to people who are blind being unemployed. And so, you know, that's an argument that a conservative really kind of could, could understand and could, could feel compassionate about and, or, or made sense to him. And so we ended up winning on, that, on those grounds. And what, what, the reason I tell you that um, is, is to say, first of all, um, when advocating... Think about who your audience is. Think about new ways, n new novel ways that you can kind of be strategic. Um, but also, more fundamentally, look for pockets of injustice. Because I bet you that's an issue that none of you guys ever thought about. Maybe, probably most of you never thought about it. Maybe none of you thought about it. Uh, but it matters to a lot of people. And so I know we all like to kind of focus on the big things that, that bleed off the front page. But there are so many little pockets of injustice like that. So let me tell you what happened next. So then... It's like, okay, well, we won the case, but now, actually, in order to do this, Congress needed to get involved. So I wrote uh, an op-ed in the Washington Post, and I'm only going to tell you this just because uh, I like the, the pun there. It wasn't make change. It was, uh, the title of the op-ed was, uh, Show Us the Money. <laughs> uh, um, and so, um, thank you. Um, and, and so then I went, I testified before Congress, and it was all about... Um, it was all about how do we make, uh, how do we actually do this thing that now the court has said we have to do. Um, I will tell you that Congressman, then Congressman Pete Stark, I thought had the most creative idea, which was to cut different size corners, different numbers of corners, rather, off different bills. So if there's two corners cut, you know it's a 20, whatever. And, and I just like that because I thought it, it was great if Congress would finally recognize that it actually does like to cut corners. <laughs> uh, uh, so... It also taught me the lesson of advocacy, which is that if you can't think of someone 
who might oppose your idea, then you're just not thinking hard enough. Um, can anyone guess which lobbying group came out against making currency tactile and, di and, dis and distinguishable by the blind? Just yell it out if you can think of it. Vending, you're right, vending machine lobby. The vending machine lobby showed up in force. So if you can't think, if you think your idea is a, is a no-brainer, um, you are just not thinking hard enough. So I want to tell you that story to, to, to share those lessons about advocacy. And one final thing about it is just to say, and I hope this is being covered in the breakout groups, is that all of these strategies need to work together, right? So right there you had litigation, you had legislation. Oh, I didn't even tell you the positive, the, the, I didn't tell you the happy ending. So the happy ending is that as a result of all of this, the Treasury Department ended up doing rulemaking. Um, and when the Trump administration, and God willing, it's... I'd be willing to wait a couple years to have it be in the next administration. Um, and and whenever, whenever they do issue the $10 bill, not only will that new bill have a woman on it for the first time, it will also be tactilely distinguishable. So we did win that battle. But, but I'm really glad I didn't leave the happy ending out. Um, but it's to say that litigation, legislation, and public relations all worked hand in hand there, right? Media strategy, strategy in the courts, strategy in Congress and in agencies. Um, so now, with those kind of, th those, are, those are kind of a couple of anecdotes about how I view what the importance of advocacy and, and kind of teaching and training people at a very young age um, how to advocate for themselves and, and, and others and being there for them and also how to think about the, the kind of panoply of tools that are available to you as lawyers and how to do that. Let me tell you a bit about how I think... Um, uh, what gives me some, some heartache about um, advocacy in our policy and our politics on our side. Because I could, it's a whole other speech slash, you know, life drama to tell you about what they're doing wrong. But I don't want to go there. Okay, I want to tell you about what I, what I worry about with us. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, th I'm going to mention three kind of uh, views that may be slightly controversial. First one is um, that I'm concerned that we are more interested um, oftentimes in using the tools of advocacy and public policy and politics for the purpose of social change as opposed to political change. Um, and I say that it, from a place of saying the social change that, that we believe in is all social change that's near and dear to my heart. So it's not that I want to slow it down. It's not that I don't want it to happen. I'd I want it to accelerate. Um, we, you know, are, are in a position, thank God, where we're finally having open and public discussions about um, the disparate impact of our laws, um, about structures of inequality, um, and uh, about uh, things uh, as uh, kind of concrete. Those are more theoretical concepts, but things as concrete as uh, the excessive use of force uh, against communities of color um, and sexual assault and sexual harassment faced by uh, women and by men um, in the workplace and in, in other power dynamics. And so that's all social change that needs to happen. The issue is that, in my view, we've become so cynical about the ability of elected officials to do anything and about our institutions to actually function, to bring about political change, that all we want now from our candidates and our elected officials are just people who can kind of be great spokespersons, right? Who can kind of just say in, you know, it's, it's, it's actually two things. One, it's to one degree, how much can they physically and, and kind of biographically embody and represent that social change? Um, and the second thing is to what degree can they, how, how eloquently can they articulate it, uh, the, 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 the theory of change. And look, those are both huge pluses. There's no question, right? But what gets lost in that is, in my view, that, that's always in politics got to be secondary to the issue of what type of actual political change can we bring about? What type of policy shifts can we bring about? And, and I'll tell you like where, where I think this was, is, is kind of uh, pretty apparent to me. There's two phenomena where you can kind of see this. One is that 
Every politician, look, if I, if I got up here and instead of saying this, I used my time to just give you a litany of all the things that like, I'm doing as lieutenant governor and like what I would do where I, I don't know, in higher office, you know, and I went off all the checklist, right, um, to talk about um, uh, racial inequality, talk about immigration, talk about the environment, all these things. Like, you guys would, like, not only would you be cheering during this section of the speech, I've noticed you've gotten quiet, um, <laughs> but also, but like, you'd all be like, this guy should run for president, you know what I mean? Like, like people are like, people are like, that's all it takes. You know what I mean? Like, that's all it takes now. It's just, it's like, it's like, well, this guy, you, like, he's blind and Iranian American, you gotta hear him speak, and like, he just said he doesn't, but you have no idea whether I'm even good at it. <laughs> you don't know. Like, you don't even, there's no Washingtonians here. You don't know. I am good at it, by the way. I am, but I, but like, but I'm saying, like, you don't know that. You know, you just think, like, I just, like, I gave a good speech, but it's like, that's like all your, and so, that, and so what happens is, so now every candidate's running for president is going to be like, I want to do this, 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 and this. Universal health care, and I want free college, and I want to, you know, 100% renewable energy. And, like, and they just say it, and they're all good things that we need to do. But no one's like, A, what's your number one priority? Because we know if you're lucky, you may get that done, right? And, and then number two, like, do you know how to do things in government? <laughs> Like, do you understand how it works? And so, um, and so that's, I think, one real symptom that basically we've gotten to a point now where, like, we treat our politicians like celebrities and we expect from them achievements in politics like we do from our celebrities, which is to say none, right? Like, we just want them to be able to say to be woke and, and, to, and, to, be, and, and to be eloquent. And, and so that's, I think, a symptom of this. And the second symptom, symptom of this is that the one thing that actually like, we ought to be progressives ought to be really happy about was this criminal justice reform that happened two months ago in Congress, and yet how much did any of us actually ever even talk about it? How much did anyone even get engaged on it? How much did anyone even say, hey, how about this amendment to the bill? How about that amendment to the bill? No, but it's way more fun. It's way more fun to just retweet a bunch of things about how like, we dream that we will... like you know, open all the prison gates one day and then, right? Like, it's just, it's just so much more aspirational and interesting. It's, it's not as fun to sit up and think about the details of how this stuff gets done. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate because actually this was an opportunity and we did, there were some good things that happened and, and more maybe could have happened if more people had been engaged instead of, um, you know, trying to kind of, uh, you know, out, outwoke each other online. So that's one. <laughs> Second thing I want to say to agitate you um, is to talk about the, the P word. And I just want to let that hang for a second, <laughs> just to have you all wonder what the P word is. Um, the P word is a word, it's a word that we use a lot in our, kind of on our side of, of, of the political spectrum. Um, and, and that word is privilege, okay? And we hear this all the time, right? We hear, we hear and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like we all just stepped out of a freshman cultural anthro class. Um, and, and so we love to talk about it. We love to recognize it. It's not even, it's just really fun to point out that you get it, right? Like, it's like, I get it. I understand. White privilege, white male privilege, white cis straight male privilege, right? Like, all these things, like, it's, it's, it feels really, it's, it's, it's part of a code. It's, it's a form of etiquette. You know what I mean? It's a way of saying I'm in the in crowd that I can use and understand these concepts. Now, I am not marginalizing the underlying concepts, okay? So before you, you know, hate me, I'm not. I'm saying here's what I, here's what I don't like about this. Two things. One is that um, it is, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I, I think you'll often hear the phrase, check your privilege at the door. You know, if someone's going to check their privilege at the door. Um, and, and, and I don't like that because, to my mind, if what you're saying is, you know, don't be an entitled jerk, then yeah. But if what you mean is, like, you know, you've got to kind of strip away all the different kind of advantages that you've been given by life, I say no. Because actually, where would I have been without my mom, who was a lawyer, who could go to the principal's office and use her privilege to help somebody. So my view is, don't check your privilege at the door. Keep your privilege on and then use it to help others who don't have that privilege, right? Right? But you all have, 
you all have, if you're here, if you're here, you're a law student, you all have privilege. No matter what else, whatever, what other ways you want to think about yourself, and I know that for many people, there is a sense of identity solidarity that comes from recognizing the ways in which we have a deficit of privilege, right? Like, I'm blind in a world that was not built by or for blind people, right? I'm Iranian-American, living my entire life since the hostage crisis in a country in which that identity is toxic. But I also grew up two miles from the two now wealthiest people on earth, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. I grew up in a wealthy school district. My parents were both graduate school educated. I, I ended up going to great universities, and now I'm a lawyer. And, and so, like, I also have tremendous privilege. And so that, that's the second thing here is, like, the idea that we always, you know, it's, this is what I think is so unnuanced sometimes about it, is that when it comes to the metrics by which we measure our own deficit of privilege, um, we like to overemphasize, and when it comes to those areas where we are ourselves privileged, it's very, con very conveniently de-emphasized. And again, I'm not trying to ignore the fact that some things are structural and some things are not structural. Right? Like, there's not been a structural discourse of oppressing left-handed people in this country the way there has been African Americans. Right? So I'm not trying to create some, some massive false equivalency. What I am trying to say is that each and every person experiences life only once and only through their lived biography, which comes with various forms of privilege and various deficits of privilege. And that gets me to the third and, and final area where I'm going to agitate you, which is to talk about my concern that we're increasingly not uh, doing our work in advocacy or policy or politics from a place of generosity. And, uh, you know, it's, it is like, no, you know, there is, there is right now, and I think in a, in a Democratic primary we're going to see this, um, there is a race, and I'm not talking about the policy race maybe to the left, but there is also a race in terms of being zero tolerance, right? And... Um, I don't know. I, 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 maybe it's liberal and not progressive or, or whatever, but like, you know, uh, I think there's a difference between saying we need justice, which we do, and saying and taking kind of pride in the concept of zero tolerance as a concept. So there's areas where we need to have a zero tolerance policy, but zero. To, but we should never feel wholly comfortable with it. You see what I'm saying? We should never. Feel, we should decide to do it but we should never revel in it too much. Because what I think it leads to is when you're, you're zero tolerance on, you know, I'm going to take a zero tolerance approach when it comes to um, uh, compromise on immigration or compromise on health care. When you start to become familiar with that, you actually do become intolerant, right? That's how that happens. And I think, you know, for me, the best way to, 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 tell, to explain this to you, how I see it, is that... Um, Visuality, I, I wrote a graduate thesis on this. Visuality is so central in the Western discourse that if you think back to the two great traditions of, of the West, the Judeo-Christian and the Greco-Roman, uh, you have one of the first words that God says in Genesis. By the way, just hang with me. This is going to connect back. Um, <laughs> you know, in Genesis, the first words God says, let there be light, right? And then what's the kind of core, you know, of the, of the Greco-Roman, you know, of, of, of Platonic philosophy is the allegory of the cave. Right and, and getting out of the case. So, so, so being able to see is so central uh, throughout our philosophical and cultural tradition in the West that language around vision is everywhere. In fact, I just used it a second ago myself when I said, you'll, you'll see where I'm coming from. So it's all over the place. And people say, you know, like, you know, we can't be blind to the injustices. Um, you know, we can't... And, and it, it, it is truly everywhere when you talk about, you know, I'm in, you know, we're in the dark here or whatever, right? And, and I just tell you that, um, or someone's being short-sighted. When you start looking at it, you'll notice it everywhere. And, and I'll tell you that if I went through life getting triggered and offended every single time somebody used that kind of language, and they use even the word blind. It's not even like some of these are more subtle, but like other ones, like people just straight up use blind as a bad thing, right? All the time. If I did that, um, I'd go insane, and I would never get anything done in the world of, of advocacy. Uh, because 
what I what because what, what I've recognized is that almost nobody who I meet has ever met a blind person before. Almost no one I ever meet and really encounter has ever met a blind person before. And so there's just a lot of ignorance that comes from that. And sometimes that person went to a really fancy law school, and so they know how to kind of figure out how to, you know, maybe be careful in how they talk to me about it. But again, I bet you many of you many of you have used that language without thinking about it. And then maybe you don't come from a cultural or social class in which wokeness etiquette has been taught to you. Um, and so you might say something that's inadvertent or might be offensive. You know, I get, I, you, you would be shocked to know it didn't stop at the playground, you guys. I mean, it's, it's all the way till when I ran for this position and people say things. And they don't just say, how can you do the job of lieutenant governor, which many of them did. But they also say things like, oh, it's so impressive how you get around. It's so great the way, you know, you, like, can, um, you know, you can just, you know, you make it up and down those stairs so easily, you know? And people say this. And it's like, the, no part of them. These are people that know that I went to Yale Law School, okay? <laughs> but, like, they, but, like, that's, like, it's, but that's just more impressive. And so, is that rude? Um, it, it, it is, but it's not intentional. <laughs> no, but it is, but it's not, but, but, but I now realize, I've learned over time, that's not what they mean. And their intentions matter, right? And, and so I could choose to just get up in their face every single time. Do you know who I am? You're telling me I want to climb the stairs. You know what I mean? What are you talking about? You know, I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. You know what I mean? Like, no, but like, I don't, it's, it's, it, but, but I, it doesn't get me over there anyway. Because then I then take them and now they feel hurt because they didn't want to be, into, and maybe they feel defensive. And maybe now someone who was a good person, who was an ally, could be an, an ally, now because I have used their kind of, their, their, their manners, their kind of really, what's a question ultimately of manners against them, that they now feel some, maybe some, some subconscious hostility to this whole concept. And this, again, is not to say that there aren't real racists. We saw the price of that right here in this city. Uh, we saw the, the evidence of that right here, um, that there is real racism in this country. There is real anti, you know, ableism, sexism. Those things are real. But I think it's incumbent upon us to, if we want to make the political change and even the social change, to follow in Dr. King's footsteps to follow, and, to, and to approach our brothers and sisters in this country with a spirit of generosity to give them the kind of moral benefit of the doubt at first and by doing so, to hold out our hand to them and welcome them into our progressive movement. Uh, and, and, and we may even find by doing so that they enrich what we do in ways that we may have never even been able to imagine. So with that, let me, let me stop. Don't clap uh, because uh, you'll get to do that when I'm all done. But I want to I ask if there are any questions uh, with whatever time we have. I know I spoke longer than maybe I should have, but I... Um, I had to connect through Charlotte to get here on a red eye, so I felt like I should talk for a while because it was hard to get here. Um, so maybe Molly can, um, can preside or can uh, moderate any questions. Any questions? Or comments or feedback or disagreement. Anything or praise. <laughs> Hi, my name is Philip Thomas. I'm a second year at Fanview College of Law. I just had a quick question for Please. you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was listening to things, some of the things that you were saying. Uh, would you say that is your experience being blind is similar to that of the experience of, a, say, a black man? Is it similar? Yes. Um, uh, only Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder. Um, <laughs> Depends on which black man. Um, no, I think, and, and so I, I think each, each discourse of injustice and of oppression and, and of, um, of kind of a, a privilege has its own dynamics, its own history. And, um, you know, in, in a really sad turn of events, um, you get to see that here uh, in the state of Virginia with the governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general 
um, where you see two different uh, histories of, uh, of oppression and violence being implicated. And um, uh, so, so, so I would say uh, no. Um, but what I would say is that I think what all of us who've experienced in some way, shape, or form what... Uh, let me say it this way. I think that what, I, what I'd like to do is to approach other Americans, other humans, uh, from a place of understanding my own privilege and my own deficit of privilege as a way of empathizing with and understanding and showing solidarity to others. And to say that I, you know, it's, it's a completely different discourse, it's a completely different history that needs to be treated in its own way. Um, similarly, like I think, um, you know, in, in, as, as an immigrant, a uh, child of immigrants, I'll say this, like, you know, for me to try to speak for immigrants who are fleeing violence in Guatemala uh, is, is uh, there's a big difference between the way my parents came to this country and the way those folks are coming here. It, there's a, you know, I think it's, it's unsurprising to me that the first black president in this country uh, is the child of uh, a Harvard-educated Kenyan immigrant, not uh, a descendant of uh, American enslaved persons. Um, so even within the African-American experience, I would hazard to say there are uh, you know, di the different histories and different ways to view it. But I, I guess what I'd like us to do is rather than using that discursive reality to divide and to, to show how none of us can understand each other, rather try to f find in that multiplicity, in that mosaic, an opportunity for us to enhance empathy of one another's situations, recognizing that they're never, they're never precisely the same. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Other uh, I'm Evan Marty. Um, I'm Sue Allen, and there's two uh, Tennessee students in law. Um, so, my question kind of has I guess a small narrative about kind of what today's society is in a nutshell. Where we kind of live in a social media generation where we capture injustices and kind of cap try to capture that lightning in a bottle of reaction and reactivity generate outrage and we kind of expect a similar sense of um, justice from not only our peers but also from our politicians and we like that kind of outcry in the early development of a collective morality in a sense that it's almost like an ancient spectacle um, generated around that kind of outrage. And what would you suggest Yeah, I, I think um, it's 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 that's such a central question right now, and you know you've seen social media companies kind of struggle, you know, uh, I mean, a not not act in good faith in many instances, but then also, you know, I, I just I don't believe that doing things like switching the algorithm around to show you different opinions, I just don't think that's gonna um, do the trick. In, in in part because they've actually shown that sometimes showing you other opinions makes you even more entrenched in your own opinion. Um, so I think that what at the systemic level, what we need to do is through our educational system, starting really early, um, and, but certainly by the time we get to uh, higher education, be training uh, folks uh, not only to, to, uh, in, the, in the skills of critical thinking, uh, but also in um, kind, of pr kind of productively engaging and, and, and reading things. And, and, you know, I think some of that is hermeneutics. Rather, it's like, how do we teach people how to read and interpret? But then also, some of this is about um, some uh, moral guidance. And, and it's a term that, you know, makes rooms like this very uncomfortable when you say things like that. Um, but, but truly, um, I think that some of this is, is not properly the role of politicians or of tech companies but is the role, again, I mentioned someone like Dr. King, 
Uh, or I mentioned someone, or you may think of someone like Mandela or Gandhi or Tutu or the Dalai Lama or Pope Francis or whatever, that, you know, you, you look at, at moral leaders like that that have been engaged also in, in struggles of various kinds, they bring a dimension to it that allows, uh, that basically polices the actions of those in the movement, right? That there's got to be some sense of somebody saying, hey, guys, that's not cool. You know, that's not what we're about. Or, you know, we can do, we can care about X, but also care about Y. Maybe say there should be justice, but we can temper that with mercy. Um, those kinds of things. And it's, it's, a, it's a big concern. I think it's a big social question right now in a time of secularization and with, with more and more people not affiliating with, with organized religion. What's going to take the place? How is that going to, uh, because, you know, Soul cycle is fine, but how are you going to take a kind of ambient spirituality and, and put some kind of a moral framework on top of it that helps us to live with one another in a way where we, where we can be, show some compassion? Um, so that's, the, that's kind of the, the two-part answer, I would say, is our educational system needs to do what it can in terms of teaching people how to read and communicate and write and, and, and all that. And then, um, and then uh, I challenge uh, all of you, any of you, uh, to, to do a double degree with the Divinity School at your university, maybe, and help us to solve the other problem. I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a large one that gives me a lot of anxiety, frankly. Yeah, um, that's a good, uh, thank you for grounding this in tactics because I think that's, that it's important, right? Because everyone kind of loves this idea in theory, uh, but then when it gets down to it, um, you know, it's when in the, in the heat of the moment, how do you do it? Uh, and, and I'll be totally transparent, like, it, it does matter for me, w like, whether I have, I'm hangry and my blood sugar's low, how generous I'm willing to be. I'm fine right now, don't worry. Um, but it's like... <laughs> How, you know, how gracious I, I can be, you know, um, in, in my own life. So it's not like I don't sometimes, you know, one of the things that happens a lot, and you can ask Christina from my staff who's here, that happens a lot, is that, like, we'll be somewhere and someone will, like, it happened at the airport yesterday when we were leaving Seattle. It's like somebody will ask her, like, um, does he have a laptop in his briefcase? You know, instead of asking me, right? So things like that happen. So um, sometimes if I'm kind of grumpy and cranky, I might be like, well, you know, you could just ask me. You know what I mean? And sometimes I'm like, I'll just answer, and, and then they'll kind of know from that um, that, oh, that was maybe kind of dumb. Maybe I should have asked him himself. Um, and sometimes I just let her answer because I'm tired or distracted, right? So it, it just it does, it's kind of depends. What I would say is here's one way to think about your question is to say um, structures are real, but people are not structures. So it is true, and it's challenging because structures work through people, right? And so how can we both address a structural phenomenon that has worked through a human agent without, and demonize that and call that out without calling out the person? How do we do it? Um, it's hard, and I'll tell you uh, one way not to do it. So my dad... Uh, he's passed away now, but he, um, when I came back from college, uh, my best friend in college, who was my, also became my roommate um, for, uh, for, the, for my sophomore through senior years, um, was openly gay and um, was kind of like my first real openly gay friend. Um, this was in 99. And I, um, and, you know, I, I kind of like my, you know, my dad was, not a homophobic person, and, and not even at that time was not a homophobic, but he was kind of, you know, I would say right in the middle of where, like, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of people were at that time. 
um, and was kind of of the group of people that, that back then would have said something like, I think it's fine, but do they have to like kind of rub it in our face? You know what I mean? This kind of thing. Like, do they have to like, does it have to be so blatant? You know, this kind of thing. And so, so anyway, so um, we would always get into these kind of arguments about things as, as I became more knowledgeable about the LGBT community, about different struggles and so on. And, and with him, and, and, and we were just getting these arguments about it. So then one time I came home uh, from college, and, I, um, and my dad said to me, I was, you know, I was at, staying with my parents, obviously, and my dad said, hey, there's this new Ben and Jerry's that just opened, um, and I'd love to go take you to, to, you know, to go check it out. I've gotten to know the owners. Um, they're a lesbian couple, and um, they're, just, you know, they're just really nice people. You know, they're just really, they're just such a, you know, they're, um, you know, he's kind of said this, and I was like, well, why you got to say that? You know what I mean? Like, who cares that they're a lesbian, you know? And, like, why would you then need to say, you're just like, what? I don't know, why are you saying, you know? And, like, I was, you know, I was, I was from New York City now. I wasn't even from Seattle. I felt like I was the sophisticated Columbia student. I came, you know, and, um, and he was, like, he was so hurt, you know? And he's like, I'm trying to agree with you. You know, I'm trying to tell you, and I realized, like, later, like, years later, I realized, like, it wasn't that he wanted to go for ice cream, right? He was trying in his own way to signal to me, hey, I've made friends who are gay, you know? I, and, 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 like, kind of say, like, I have, you know, this is his way of saying, like, yeah, I, I'm starting to understand the LGBTQ, the things that we've argued about, like, I'm, you know, kind of, and what did I do? I just was like, <laughs> You know, you're not woke enough in how you're telling, you know, you didn't say it the right way, you know, or you said, you know, you was just awkward, and, and so that's, what, what is that? That comes from a structure, right? What was I identifying? They're kind of a weird structure where, like, what? it's so heteronormative. Isn't it so heteronormative? What? No one comes and says, like, go check out the Ben and Jerry's, this really nice straight couple runs it, <laughs> right? It's, that's, it's a classic example of heteronormativity, right? But that wasn't him. That wasn't him. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I guess um, the way I deal with it is to try to educate in a way that's not patronizing, so, but uses humor, but uses kind of lightness that says, like, you know, yeah, I know, you know, I know, I know this is what you meant, you know, gives them the benefit, says, I know this is what you meant. Some people are more sensitive and might think that you meant this. And, you know, I know there's people probably here who are like, why do I have to coddle this racist asshole? You know what I mean? Like, I, I understand where that comes from. The, the anger and the frustration is like, why do we keep having to do this? When will our moment come? When they have to do the work. And I'm sorry to tell you, if we want to do this in a way that's not ultimately viewed as zero sum, but is actually greater than the sum of its parts and, is, and, and, and grows our, friend, our, our kind of friendships and, 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 and our allies, then we have to do it in a way that is warm-hearted, generous of spirit and gracious. Think about the way, even when I told you guys about, why do you think I say the thing about Cindy Lauper and Boy George? The, thing I, the reason I say that in speeches is because I've just told you how I became blind from cancer, okay? It's this terrible, ugly, awful thing that may make everyone feel kind of sad or, like, you know, awkward, right, um, and not know what to say next. Like, I could say, well, it's not my job to make them feel better. I'm the one who had to go through the chemotherapy when I was a kid. These people didn't. Why do I care if they feel kind of uncomfortable? But it's just the decent, so I tell a joke so that now you get it that, like, I'm not sad about it, right? Like, I'm living my life, and we're able to talk about these things, and it then gives you space to say, this, this isn't this guy's not that different from me. This thing that's kind of foreign and weird, actually he's laughing about it in a way that makes him approachable. So it's the, it's the kind thing to do to the audience. I don't say it because I want your laughter. I say it actually because I want to give you permission to be okay with that and for us to move on and move forward in our relationship where the blindness won't be a central factor anymore. You see what I'm saying? So it, it, does, take a, it does take both um, patience and grace, but, but, but in, a ta in a kind of tactical sense, it also takes some of these tools that we have, thank God, as humans. Um, charm and delicacy and courtesy and these things that you can't do in 280 characters, but we can do in real life. Or on a Twitter story. So, 
We have time for one more. What do we have? Oh, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, if we don't. Hi, my name is Henry. I'm a one out student at the University of Virginia. I had a question about how would you recommend um, getting started in terms of advocating for a specific issue within the legal context. Um, and I was thinking about what's the quality where that might be like the front page issue that's really big in your head. Yeah, so, so th that's, that's exactly what I, I th that realization. Is um, is exactly what I what I would have said to you is is the look for those pockets of injustice you know look for the things because um, we all want to be kind of like you know dragon slayers right? we all want to take on and just say destroy the structural wealth inequality and, and so on and you know what you'll all get the chance to do that when you vote for president somewhat because even a president can't do it all uh, as I was saying earlier. Uh, but the big questions will all be kind of out there and debated in, in that process. But for us, as we get kind of started and we come out of law school, I think finding those, uh, it, because the structure is made up of so many different um, composite, uh, both uh, uh, causes and also symptoms, right? Upstream and downstream, there are these dynamics. Um, so the the the... For example, if you're interested in, um, maybe you say, I'm interested in housing because uh, affordability of housing, you know, that's the, that's in, in the most kind of basic uh, of, of um, needs that has a kind of big economic uh, price tag on it and that people can, uh, you know, how does wealth inequality kind of manifest in many instances um, at the local and regional level and is in people not being able to stay in their homes. Um, having to move away or maybe even become homeless. And so maybe you want to start then interrogating that question of, okay, how is that happening? Is it about zoning? Is it about land use? Is it about the use of funding for, um, you know, um, is it about the need for more subsidies? Is it about um, pegging wages to the cost of living? Is it about um, wanting better policies to incentivize inclusionary zoning kind of policies to incentivize more affordable housing development? You know, look, digging into that to see what can we do about it. And maybe you would go even more granular and you say, let's look at, well, how does it happen when a person gets evicted? You know, how do we, if we want to deal with homelessness, how do we think about when the person, when we think the person might become homeless, how do we stop them from becoming homeless in the first place? Um, can we create some policies there? And so, I, I, again, I think you all have the tools to do this. Um, and I would say uniquely as progressive lawyers, you're, you're in a position where you can be stewards of nuance, right? You can go deeper and get to understand the policy challenges and what types of mechanisms are available. Okay, here's the problem we've got. Do, here are the component parts of it. In terms of solutions, do we want to use a taxing mechanism? Do we want to use a regulatory mechanism? Do we want to use a public-private mechanism? Like... What, you know, we want to use the criminal code. Like, those are all things that you guys in your, in your studies right now, you're learning the different parts of that to help you then diagnose and prescribe for all the various different big structural issues, but then get, get it down to a level that's realistic. And you, that, you will find that in affirmative litigation. You'll find that in the process of legislative advocacy. You'll find that in the arena of um, kind of media and public relations as well. So um, I'm just so excited for you guys. I want to say, you know, um, you all, um, not only is it going to be the case that ACS um, will be viewed not as, as the Fed Sox kind of uh, um, uh, lefty uncle or cousin or <laughs> nephew, but, uh, but, but actually um, they are, despite their huge financial advantage right now and their history and everything, um, come on, this is the legal profession. How are we letting the conservatives outdo us? It's unreal. They, they are, so they've had some structural, they've had some structural help um, uh, in terms of control of the Senate and the judiciary and Mitch McConnell and straight up mendacity and all those things that have led to that dynamic being where they are. But 
make no mistake, the people in this room, when you guys meet up at lawyer conferences for ACS in 15 or 20 years, you're all going to be the power brokers, the professors that write the letters of rec for the, the clerkships. You're going to be the federal judges. You're going to be the politicians. You may even make it beyond lieutenant governor and become governors. You're going to do all those things. You're going to be that way. And, then, and people truly um, are, are going to say, as they do right now, about Supreme Court nominations. They're going to be like, we cannot get anything through uh, to Senate Majority Leader Ocasio-Cortez unless ACS <laughs> has blessed it. She just won't even take our meetings with these potential judges and justices. So it's going to happen, and you guys are in the generation of ACS members that are going to actually be there to see that transformation happen. So thank you so much for letting me be a small part of it this evening. God bless you.